Ben's the general manager of research at the Condinan Group in Western Australia. He's an agricultural engineer, and he's also the Condinan Group's research manager of Farming Ahead magazine, which many of you might be familiar with. And he's also a member, some of you may have seen him in the last few weeks, talking with GRDC about stored grain. He's based in Western Australia, but comes from a farming family in the New England region of northern New South Wales. Since completing his engineering studies at the University of Southern Queensland, he's worked for Condinan for at least 20 years. Ben has extensive experience in reviewing and communicating a wide range of innovations and technologies, including in the ag tech, extension, ag tech field. He's conducted a review of a wide range of commercially available sheep handlers, cattle crushers and yard design, and he'll explain the findings here today. He will also talk about the things to consider when you're setting up a new set of yards. So please welcome Ben. Thanks, Jody. Um, geez, 20 years with Condinan Group sounds like a long time, doesn't it, when you say it like that? Um, yeah, I've been fortunate to work with uh, with Condinan Group for, for that 20 years, and we we've been able to do some some great stuff. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with with what Condinan Group is. Um, we're a little bit like Choice Magazine, but for agriculture. So we're independent. We evaluate all sorts of machinery and, and, uh, and livestock equipment. And we put together uh, a report around that equipment uh, in a magazine called Farming Ahead, which comes out monthly. And I can tell you, having, I was the editor for sort of seven years up until recently, uh, that month comes around pretty bloody quickly all the time, you know, trying to, trying to put all this stuff together. So um, a couple of the uh, research reports that we've done over the last sort of uh, four or five years that, that are relevant to you guys and relevant to the information you, you're getting today uh, is around you know, livestock infrastructure and, and uh, handling equipment, um, yards, sheds. Emily's going to talk a bit about sheds later on today. And I think um, at the end of the day, we're talking about uh, machinery that, or equipment that's going to help you in your farm business and, and hopefully make things a little bit easier and a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, and as Nathan said before, you know what excites you about your, your, your business and about uh, livestock production in general. Uh, for me, it, it's some of this, this new technology and new equipment that can make life a little bit easier and make the job a little bit more enjoyable. So, just a couple of the reports that we've done, and I'll focus on sheep handlers for a start, so we'll kick off with that. And then we're going to have a look at and talk about uh, sheep yards, and we'll finish off with some cattle crush information. So. So we've done three lots of sheep handler testing. Um, uh, the first uh, probably was around 2015, I reckon. So it's a few years ago now. But it's interesting, um, you know, Nathan was talking about the rate of change of technology. A lot of these sheep handlers haven't changed too much in that time. That we have seen some gradual improvement uh, in performance. But we've also seen the integration of, uh, of a lot of other tech. So EIDs obviously come in and, and, and created I suppose value add uh, to the to the uh, to the handling equipment that we've got there. So um, the three reports we've got there uh, included not only um, you know your, your uh, single animal ha handlers, but also your bulk handlers as well. So I'll touch on those as well. So what is it that we want in uh, in a in a sheep handler? What are we looking for? Who owns a sheep handler? Who's looking to, or thinking about buying one? Jeez, a few? Yep, right. Eh? What do we want? You've got to be ergonomic. You've got to be able to work with these bits of gear. We've got to make sure that uh, it's safe for the operator. Animal welfare, big issue these days. We're going to cart it around the place. It needs to be easy to transport. If we're going to shift it from one set of yards to another. Do we need to move, you know, George, you mentioned before, you know, moving it within the yards needs to be manoeuvrable. How hard is it to do that? Got different size animals you're putting through it. Might need to adjust the, the dimensions of the of the catching frame to uh, you know to catch different size animals through through the through the handler. It needs to be quiet. Some of them are bloody loud. And it can stir up the animals and, and of course stress. Uh, in the animals means it's never a good day in the yards for whoever's working in there. If, if you're running, working with stressful anim or stressed animals, you need to be able to get to the bits you need to get to. If you're doing some crutching or wigging, whatever it is. And some handlers will actually provide better access for some jobs than others. 
Uh, in a lot of cases, we see people that have maybe a couple of handlers, depending on what the job they're doing. All the basics come into play, build and, and quality of finish. If you're going to have it in a set of yards, it's a pretty harsh environment. You need to make sure it's going to uh, last uh, for a long time and, and provide you with good service life. And it's not going to break or fail in the middle of uh, a mob of sheep. You've got to be able to integrate that technology we were talking about before, whether it's EID or, or uh, anything else. You need to be able to get parts. And you're probably thinking about the, the service and delivery aspect of things. You know, you, you need... Uh, Decent PD. We've tested some handlers where the, where the pre-delivery wasn't done particularly well, either because the agent selling it didn't know enough about the, the handler um, or it wasn't done from the factory. And if there's, you know, if there's a, a, an element of technology integrated into that handler, sometimes some, some training might be required as well. So you're looking, for that, you're looking for all these features when you're buying a handler. Have you got power and air on site? Do you need to think about that as well if you're going to make that investment? Does it work for left or right handers? How many left handers have we got in the room? Do people cater for you? <laughs> Do people cater for you very often? No. Nah. It's a bit rough, isn't it? Can the handlers be customised to suit requirements? Whether that's your yards or if you're not ambidextrous, which most of us aren't. We need to ultimately improve efficiency and workflow. That's what we're looking to do here with a handler, right? The big one is just reduce that physical effort. Carting sheep around all day has got hairs on it. It's bloody hard work. And if we can just make that a little bit easier, we're going to enjoy what we do a lot more. Okay? So we've got three primary styles. That clamp in the, up, in the standing position, capture and rotate, and then your bulk handlers. Okay? And one thing that Nathan mentioned before and gave us a pretty good demonstration of was that that lead-up rate has to work. If that doesn't work, the sheep handle is not going to work. It's a crucial part of that, of that investment. So if you're thinking about investing uh, <coughs> pardon me, in a sheep handler, make sure that you've thought about how you're going to feed sheep into it. Now, whether that's a dual race, uh, as we mentioned before, you know, whether you've got something like back up Charlie there that will feed around into it. Any backing bars. All these, all these things are, are important to make sure you get the most out of the investment you've made in the handler. And it needs to work in your yards because in some yards, you know, you can't fit this in or depending on where the handler's going to go in the yards, you might need to think pretty, pretty carefully about that lead up. So that's important. Right, so let's, let's have a look at some of the, the results and some of the findings that, that we came up with. And if you've got one of these handlers uh, and you've got some more to add, I'd really love your feedback. So if you just pop your hand up and let us know what you think. Kick off with the Clipex. So made in China. This is the second time we tested these. Um, and we did see some refinement from the first time to the second time. So it's got a hot dip frame, um, nylon bushes throughout, so pretty low maintenance. Uh, wears pretty well. Um, the fold out entry ramp, and then of course you've got the, both a pre catch area and a three way draft integrated. So, this is the contract that we're talking about. Uh, it's a clamp and tip um, with those lifting panels for the head and also the rear end, so you can get to where you need to get to. Air requirement 85 psi, uh, so 12 CFM compressor will do the job, is the recommendation from Clifex. Weighs about 750 kg. So if you're going to shift it with ar around your yards, you might need to think about either not doing that or make some plans not to do that or getting some pretty strong people. It does have some um, electric jacks that will lift it up, um, but they're incredibly slow. Uh, that was our finding. So whether that's improved since we looked at these, I'm not sure. But, but again, something to just ask if you, if you, are, if you are looking at them uh, at a clip -X. Combi clamp, yep. Um, so ultimately using the weight of the operator, so for someone like me, that's not a problem, probably going to crush a few sheep, you never know. Uh, and, and we talked about the, the lefties and the right-handers, you know, this caters for left-handers as well, as well, it can be set up for left-handers. Um, there's some coarse and fine adjustment there for animal size, uh, and that foot-locking bar 
uh, uh, the, the clamping bar will lock, so there's an, another mechanism that will hold that closed. If you need to walk away and do something else, the animal will still be retained. Um, trampoline springs used, um, so easy to get parts if they snap. Um, and you can get a transportable version. So, But by and large, pretty light by comparison. So, and I think that's the, the, the key with any of these handlers is that, you know, sometimes they're fit for a specific purpose. So, drenching, little bunghole crutch, no dramas at all. Full crutch, more difficult. Oh, no, what about the Gallagher crutching and dag? Um, yeah, as I said, the, you know, again, fit for purpose, crutching, dagging, you know, drenching. Uh, it's got a top clamping, clamping action um, and that pneumatic entry gate. Uh, you can't adjust the, the height of where that animal is presented. So for shorter or taller operators, that could be problematic. You might need to make some adjustment to the setup when you first put it down on the ground. Um, speaking of shifting, it is a two-person job um, to, to put the wheels on that and, and shift it. Uh, can't be done with one person. You can use the, uh, uh, the drawbar there to, to leverage it up, but of course you need someone to, to pop the wheels back in on it. Um, one of the things we thought was that this, uh, the pneuma you know, pneumatic tip cylinder sort of got in the road if you're moving front to rear of the animal, so you've got to walk out around it all the time. Um, and uh, there is an auto way version as well. So uh, our understanding is there might be some refinement and a, and a bit of an update coming for this particular um, unit as well. Peak hill handler. Anyone used one of these at all? Yep. A couple of things that we... we uh, came up with, uh, so of course this is mainly uh, fabricated using uh, gal sheet and 25 mil sectional steel, um, only requires uh, 8 CFM compressors, so pretty low air requirement. Um, one of the things we sort of found was that there's a little bit of intrusion from the animal about to come in to, that, to the uh, rotational area, and that could be problematic, um, so we just needed to keep them back a little bit. Um, in terms of shifting, retractable handles, a set of uh, quad bike tyres go on and it's pretty easy to shift. Um, cradle height and clamping positions in front to rear can also be adjusted pretty easily. So, so a bit of adjustability there. Uh, we saw a uh, uh, contract uh, crutcher in WA using one of these and is, uh, I suppose it all comes down to being used to the machine but it's put them through not, uh, quite quickly. Again from Peak Hill, similar sort of uh, Laser cut profile gal sheet um, with, uh, with your hex socket, head, shoulder screws. Uh, upright clamping position, great for drenching. Um, electronic eye, you can move backwards and forwards to adjust clamping position. And you might need to do that because depending on how animals are feeding into this, if they're going you know, pretty quickly, you might need to move the eye back so that you've got that reaction time for the machine to catch, it, uh, catch the animal in the appropriate position. Um, but they do tend, depending on uh, whether you've got this optional uh, ramp or not, they do tend to, to run pretty quickly through it. So. And Tapari. So we're due to have another look at this uh, later on this year. Um, it's got a, a, a few new features, some ad adjustment in uh, some of the rotary switches, uh, which replace toggles of the old unit. Um, remote control uh, and integrated hock bars. So yeah, stand by for a little bit more information on, uh, on that one. So as I mentioned, when we do this testing, we normally try and get a panel of farmers together with, uh, with ourselves. We've got a, a team of um, engineers and ag researchers, and we, uh, we, get, uh, you know, we try and get some objective measurement uh, wherever we can. Um, anecdotal and subjective data is always useful, but if you can put some numbers around some of these things, that's always good. So what we ended up doing was um, putting, uh, putting sheep through uh, each machine, and uh, and simulated a drench. We did that three or four times uh, just to get a bit of a feel for the sort of typical flow through rate, um, in this case for 20 sheep. So given this is from a couple of years ago, I reckon those prices have probably increased probably pretty dram dramatically. We'll talk about buying steel in a minute. Um, and of course that's all getting passed on, which is, uh, which is great, uh, not. Um, rating here from the, from the panel. Um, so uh, again, Jody's got copies of, uh, of these reports, and, and we're happy to share them with uh, with anyone here today. So, um, so the panel went through the build quality, maintenance, ease of operation, adjustability, and then we did this time to drench 20 sheep. Now, the peak yield handle, obviously, because the, the sheep's in the uh, 
uh, inverted position. We don't, we're not really going to drench them in that position, but just to give you an idea of the, uh, they were just mouthed um, for, that, for that run of 20 sheep. Just to give you an idea of, as to how, um, how the sheep were running through that particular handler. Right, so if we go into the, uh, the, the bulk handlers, we'll kick off with the pro way, so available in 6 or 12 metre units. Um, uh, the 12 metres is obviously a, a, com a combination of two 6 metre units, about 840mm wide. Um, 6 metre units can be configured as a transportable unit, so you, you can actually shift that around. Um, and you can get an optional roof for those models as well. So, uh, again, pretty big unit, difficult to put wheels on. Um, but uh, tend to work well. Anyone use one of these? Bulk handler? No? Um, just as an indication, so we, we spoke to um, a, a couple of growers who are using these and tried to get a, a little bit of information as to you know, what, you know, what sort of numbers they're putting through. Um, 20 to 30 full body sheep uh, per race full. Uh, and and the, way we're talk, you know, the way this works is it lifts the sheep up about 400 mil off the, off the deck. Um, a little rubber skirt there stops any leg entrapment. Um, do what you need to do, uh, you know, if you're drenching or whatever, and then um, you can open the, the front gate from the rear once you've uh, once you've lowered uh, once you've lowered the sheep back down on the ground. So one of the people we spoke to was uh, this lady Cynthia Parker. Um, she ended up with a, a bulk handler. She handles about eight or ten thousand weathers a year, uh, all going to the export trade out of WA. Um, uh, the reason she ended up with a with a handler is because she was uh, uh, tagging some some weathers at one stage, and one of them, you know, in, in the race that is, one of them jumped up and hit her in the mouth. She broke her jaw. She's in hospital in Perth for weeks. Took her about six months to recover, and decided this was a better way to go. So, you know, I, I think we, we talked about all the desirable features of a sheep handler before, and and one of those was uh, was operator safety. And I think you know there's some definite benefits. Uh, to having a handler, and, and Cynthia is a, a pretty good example of uh, of how that's uh, how that's the case. So these are a hydraulic units, so you've got to have either um, electricity on site, or have a generator that'll run uh, the, uh, the hydraulic power pack that'll uh, lift the animals up and down. Um, sorry, and then on to the Murray. So Murray, another bulk handler, um, two two races, um, sort of side by side. Um, We've got seven metres long. Um, one of the things that we noticed with all the Murray units we went and had a look at was there was a, some adaptation up the front. So it's a big step to get up in, into it. Um, so either ramps, uh, all sorts of combinations of things we used to, to modify it. And uh, I don't think we saw one uh, that didn't have a, some welding on it. And that's one of the things that I think people often do is, is just, um, you know, they might customise the unit themselves to suit their yards or suit their operation. Um, there's two V cradles, as we mentioned. Uh, so just as sheep are running into uh, the, the Murray handler, just, just as it's getting pretty full, uh, you elevate. Um, and, uh, and it's got an interesting sort of mechanism to, to lift everything. It actually uses a, a, a car tyre, uh, inflates that. As that inflates, it pushes out and, and lifts, the, uh, lifts the sheep up or lifts the Vs up. So the Vs can actually be adjusted uh, for larger or smaller frame sheep. Um, and as I mentioned before, it does have... Uh, uh, it does have wheels on uh, removable stub axle hubs, so you can just pop those off, uh, put it down. You can transport it uh, around the place. A um, couple of modifications, you know, different taps, release valves for, uh, you know, if you wanted to open it from, or wanted to uh, lower the sheep from up the front of the race, you can. Um, the other one was that we saw quite a few sheep slipping off the off the uh, that bottom. Platform, so you know, just a, a piece, a couple of pieces of rod welded onto that would have done um, would have done wonders. And, and again, you know, as we say, the, the, the modifications to a lot of this machinery are uh, uh, quite common. And yeah, that's one of the things that to, uh, this, this owner was going to do. All right, so look, there's a stack of others. There's a stack of other handlers, and I haven't, if I haven't covered, um, you know, the one that you're interested in today, come and have a chat to us because we've probably seen most of them. So Hecton. Uh, Perkins, uh, Dan Darrigan, there's a whole stack of, uh, of handlers out there that, um, uh, that, that people are using. Um, and every time we revisit this, uh, this report, we try and include as many as we can. The other thing I want to talk about today is uh, shed, uh, you know, shape yard design and also um, integrating that into 
what we've got with the handler. You know, we talked about the importance of, of getting sheep to feed into the handler, uh, and that means that the yards have got to be uh, got to be set up uh, correctly. But there's a few things we've got to think about if we're going to invest in in yard infrastructure. Planning design. Who's going to do it? How are you going to do it? Think about a long-term view. Incorporating any old infrastructure that might be there. Are you going to expand? What are you going to use to build it with? What materials have you got on hand already? What, what sort of features are you going to integrate into that design? Curves or diamonds? What's going to make she sheep flow well through your yards? What sort of sheep have you got that you're going to put through it? Races. I've seen so many different designs of races. It's not funny. You're going to go undercover. Which bits are going to be undercover? All of it? Just some of it? Latches and catches? It's going to be easy to use, in and out. If you're going to have a handle, do you need power, air or water on site? What, what's got to be there? You're going to concrete some areas? Which bits? You're going to put a loading ramp in there. Is it going to conform with uh, you know, some of the new regulations that, that, that sit around, uh, around loading ramps? And ultimately, if you're going to get someone to install it, are they going to do a good job? big list, isn't it? And, there, and you can go down a rabbit hole with every single one of those things, trying to work out what you're going to do if you're going to invest money in a new set of yards. So let's run through some of those. Planning and design. One of the key things is just thinking about site and or orientation. Are you going to have to shift some dirt you know, to get a level site? Is there another site that you could use that you don't have to shift so much dirt? Earthworks are costly. The yard's going to be in the right spot for the farm from a logistical perspective. Is there existing infrastructure there, an old shed? And the big question that we often get is, you know, do we try and integrate the existing shed into the new plans or do we just go, that's going to compromise the design too much, let's bugger that off and start again. And that can be pretty tough. I don't know, people get emotionally attached to yards, I don't know why. Most of them hate going there. What's that about? Terrain, soil type, again, kicking into that, that, uh, that earthwork side of things. Um, slope and drainage, uh, you, you've got to have some slope there. You don't, you don't want to be working in a quagmire and, and have you know, ponds of water around the yards. And wind and weather can be a big factor as well. Okay? Now, some of these things can be, you know, for example, if, you've got, if you're going to put your yards under cover, some of these things may not be too much of a consideration. You know, wind and weather, if you're under cover, that's fine. You might want to think about the prevailing winds and whether, how that might affect things if you are, even if you are under cover. But in some cases, you know, whether you've got to shift some, some trees, uh, whatever you have to do uh, to, to pick the correct site uh, is important. Investment and expansion. Anyone ever traded in a set of yards? Didn't think so. It's pretty hard, isn't it? You only spend the money here once. Uh, so you either put them in or you're cutting them out. You're not, you're not going to trade them in. You might modify them a little bit, but at the end of the day, this is a long-term investment. You're going to spend a fair bit of money on a, on a quality set of yards. Or you use them a fair bit. And you might want to think about this, just staging that build bit by bit. You might want to think, well, you know, we've got, as Chris said before, we, we, we've identified where we can, we can uh, invest some money out of our business and get a good return on investment. We're going to do that first. And there's another component of that that we can do later on. So think about staging the build. You don't have to do it all at once, but, but in, in doing that, you need to think about how you're going to stage that build and, and how it might work. Think about also you know, your future requirements, whether that's integrating some technology down the track. Materials. Anyone price steel lately? Scary, isn't it? Steel prices are going through the roof. But if you are pricing up steel, make sure you're pricing quality steel. There's, there's steel and there's steel. Um, sometimes you can get away with downgrades, that's fine. Um, but you don't, if, you, if you're paying for a quality um, pre-gal section, for example, you want to make sure that it is good quality. Think about your thickness options, your, your wall thicknesses, and, and, and if you're buying um, prefabricated yards or, or a set of yards, through a manufacturer, get a bit of an idea of what sort of grade steel they're going to use. 
as I said, think about those galvanising options, whether it's hot dip or pre-gal, um, and think also about the railing. Now, the, the K-rail sort of style is becoming pretty popular. Certainly in WA, we're seeing a lot of that, um, where the, uh, the builder will rock up on site or a subcontractor to the builder will rock, rock up on site, and they'll have straps uh, that get rolled out in particular profiles. Uh, and some of those profiles are, are great, you know, they're nice and strong, they're flexible enough to go around curves, some a little bit sharp on top if you are going to climb over, or you have to climb over, you want to make sure that there's no potential for injury there. So um, just have a look at, at some of those options with regard to the on-site um, uh, 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 on um, rail profiles. Welds and joins, if you're going to buy prefab yards, just make sure they're good quality. I was at uh, one of the cattle crush manufacturers in, um, where was it? It was in Queensland the other day, and we were looking at some of the prefab sections there that they had. Um, and they said, oh, all Australian made, welded in Australia. And the welding quality was fantastic. I said, how do you make that economic? He said, well, it just happens to be uh, handy that we're about 35 minutes from Wakehold Jail. So they just send all the steel down there, and it comes back in panels. 35 bucks an hour is all they pay the welders down there. I reckon. Uh, well, uh, yeah, if they had to pay a commercial rate, that could be a bit of a different story. Curves and races, bugle's still king, and the lead up into the race. Um, uh, diamonds in between sets of yards are becoming more popular because it just gives that flexibility on where sheep are going to flow. Um, and race, as race designs vary, as I said before, I've seen multiple different uh, iterations and variations of races. Um, with mid-race uh, gates that sort of flick over, uh, if you've... Uh, if you, if you don't want to fill a full race, um, dual races side by side, animals one leading the other, vertical bars in the, uh, in the exit gate uh, just to aid the flow. Undercover does create a much more pleasant work. So who's got yards undercover? A um, couple of little things. Sometimes, you know, if it's been a bit dry, uh, you might need a little bit of water in there to just settle the dust. We just pop some sprinklers on at home, um, let that settle a little bit of moisture. Uh, if you can't afford to do it all in one hit, just think about, again, doing it in stages. You might want to think about just doing the race. If you're building a, a new shearing shed, you might want to think about um, just at least facing it in, in the right direction or orientating it in the right direction so that you can extend the portals out and, and cover the rest of the yards. Uh, just to reduce the shadows and balking, that can be, that can be, uh, that can be pretty useful. It can be done later, but, you know, Again, as I said, you need to just plan for it, uh, and those steel prices keep in, uh, increasing in price, so um, it's probably never going to get cheaper than when it is right now. Latches and catches, um, and I've also included PA gates here. You can't have too many of those. Um, notice the little dog flap. Uh, saves dogs uh, jumping over, over fences and, and through uh, sorry, panel sections. Um, just, it means they're not as tight at the end of the day. Uh, and think about how many times you go in and out of a, a gate, and how many times you latch and unlatch and relatch. How much time are you chewing up there? So you know potentially, you know, some of your top-mounted latches like this work well, provided you haven't got animals that are going to knock them open on you and box up a couple of mobs of sheep, or the draft that you've just done. Power, air, and water. Make sure you've got those on hand if you need them. Um, you know, for for some hand pieces and and uh, and um, sheep handlers, you might need. Um, both of these things. One of the options that you've got with a, as a handler that uses air is that you might put the compressor a fair way away and run a big pipe up to, uh, uh, up to the handler. The big pipe acts as an air receiver and gives you a little bit more air in, in the system. So that's an option. Uh, concrete, where are you going to do it? Just in areas that, that are uh, obviously high traffic and you need to think about um, if you're pouring a, a race, you need to give yourself, be generous with that pour. Make sure you've got plenty of space to work down the side. Uh, quite often it's, you know, always six inches too short. Think about maybe putting a toe gap in under the race here. It just gives you that little bit of extra leverage if, you move, if you're trying to reach out into the race. One option you, you've got is um, a bag of concrete every three square metres. Dig that in if you've got soil type that's, that's friendly to that. Uh, and then plate compact it, good quality gravel. Just makes it easier to clean. Loading ramps, there is a, um, an ALRTA guideline that should be followed. Um, they talk about 
access for the, for the drivers and, and probably just refer you to that document. If you are going to invest in, in, uh, in a loading ramp, it's worth asking the question as to whether it's compliant. The big thing is installation. If you're going to go and buy a set of yards, make sure the installers do a good job. Go and have a look at some of the yards that they've built previously. Make sure you're comfortable with how they're building the yards and, and that, uh, that everything's done as you think it should be done. It's a big investment. That's it with yards. Let's move on to cattle crushers. Who's running cattle? Okay. Right. Eh? You can help me out with this. Bit of a quick uh, buyer's checklist. So we're going to kick off with safety, making sure that the, the uh, vet gates and vet access areas are all, all uh, tickety-boo. Just make sure that there's no chance of no pinch points, or if there are, that they're well labelled. We want to keep things down to a minimum in a noise, from a noise perspective. Look for areas of potential entrapment. Uh, if we're talking about particularly on the squeeze, um, there's a couple of different squeeze designs. Obviously, you've got your V-squeeze, parallel, single-sided, parallel. Um, some of the squeezes swing up, which means that when they swing back down, they might trap feet. Uh, from a floor perspective, you don't want that to be solid and provide some grip. You don't want it to be, to be slippery. That's a, a great way to drop animals in a crush. And of course, that goes without saying that you need some, some ability to get animals out there if they do go down in that crush. It's just making sure that that latching mechanism is, is sound. It needs to be reliable, both on the head bale and the squeeze. Access gates can be a bit of a, a personal preference as to where you've got them, depending on how you like to work. Um, obviously, uh, being able to get in for, vac uh, for vaccinations up near the, up near the neck is, is important. Um, so provision for that uh, is obviously something you'd be looking for. Um, and when I'm talking about latching here, I'm talking about uh, make sure that the latches are easy to use, easy to slam closed. Um, and that includes side gates and, and also handles, as well as head bail action. A lot of those can be adjusted according to suit. Um, uh, neck extender bars, um, chin scoops. Uh, as I said before, those locking mechanisms for the head bail do vary. Um, but we've gone away from that sort of ratchet style that we used to have. Um, Look at, uh, for the release, there's the integration of um, uh, shock absorbers as well that we're starting to see as well. So rather than the crush going bang and releasing, uh, a lot of designs have integrated shock absorbers into that, into that uh, uh, geometry. We're also seeing a bit, uh, some new materials integrated into the design and build. So oil impregnated nylon um, bushes are used in a lot of cases. You might have had brass in the, back in the day and a really good quality crush. Um, and what that means is that it limits some of your maintenance requirement. Uh, and also things, you know, in the case of, I think it's a lights CIA, you've got uh, a, a bit of a composite design for the head bale rollers. One of the things we noticed uh, when we looked at crushes most recently uh, is that uh, some of the components are designed to wear. So you might get some of those nylon, uh, that nylon material, uh, particularly on the squeeze, might work as a, as a shim or a, a, a um, skid plate that's designed to come off and be replaced in, in time. A lot, of the, a lot of these crushes can be um, ordered as air or hydraulic operated, um, or you can do it later on, or you might just want to do certain components. So you might just want to do the head bale, say, as, a, uh, as air or hydro at the start, uh, or do it later on. Uh, make sure that you've got ability to uh, integrate your EID um, and load bar provision, uh, and a combination for the scale head. So this is a Tapari. Uh, so they've got a little panel that click, clicks in over this. Uh, keeps all your electronics safe and sound and, and tucked away. So look, there is a uh, report, it's a current edition of Farming Head uh, where we've done a, a bit of a run through on cattle crushes and looked at pricing. And again, I'll send that to Jody. She, she can happily uh, share it with you. And if you're not a community group member and you'd like to be one, there's a little discount code there. So. Bit of a plug.